welcome back to the fifth episode of the History Machine podcast. This episode is on Alexander the Great, and if you haven't listened to our earlier works, you can go back and listen to the episodes one to four. I am Niall, and my co-host here is... Cahill. Okay, so I suppose Alexander the Great, this is the big cheese, the huge name of the ancient world, the Rocky Marciano, Floyd Mayweather, undefeated, super heavyweight, mega champion of the world, all rolled into one. So I suppose just as an example to explain just how influential and huge this person is, Julius Caesar at the age of 30 will look at a statue of Alexander the Great. You have conquered the world at 30, and I, Julius Caesar, have done nothing with my life. So (laughs) He's he's definitely one, like, renowned by his contemporaries, by all his successors. The last episode, which was on the Punic Wars, we even mentioned how Scipio and Hannibal had basically this podcast 2,000 years ago where they're arguing about who were the best generals in history, and the one bit they could definitely agree on, Alexander was number one up to that point. Yeah. He's a fantastic commander. He's undeniably influential across the total global effects of history. The Western civilization, their foundations, he is a pivotal person in the events that happen. With Alexander in mind, it's very hard to kind of explain. He doesn't just come out of the blue. He's not kind of like a Genghis Khan who, you know, who starts in a small village, works his way up and conquers his way through everything. He is not really a self-made man. When we think about Alexander, he is effectively a rich trust fund kid, rugby, chums, that kind of feel to him. He is from the upper class. He does get to inherit a colossal, phenomenal army. And to explain where that comes from, we definitely have to talk about Philip II of Macedonia. So for the timeline, if you listened to the third episode on Greece, you might remember Epimonandas. And he was a very key pivotal figure in Thebes, a fantastic commander, came up with loads of innovations. But Philip II of Macedon was a hostage of his and definitely picked up tricks of the trade just being around him and learning from him and studying. When Philip does eventually get to return home to Macedon, he gets to become king, he consolidates his power and he decides that he is going to invest very heavily in having an amazing army. Now, north of Greece is the area of Greece that really has good cavalry. So it's the only area of Greece that actually has decent horsemen. And Philip says, well, this is our natural strength, is having great horsemen. What we need to do is we need to make the infantry not necessarily as good as them, but we need to up it to like the next tier of organisation, of structure, have these guys well drilled and ready to go. The big innovation that he comes up with is if we can imagine the old Greek phalanx that we've mentioned several times before. And that is, just as a quick recap, you've got your spear in your right hand, you're heavily armoured, you've got this nice round shield on your left hand, and you use that shield to cover the person to your left, the man to your right is covering you a little bit, and it's a really neat, close-knit formation that's held together with a combination of peer pressure and like rigid structure, and it's very effective And it's a great infantry. But Epimonandas, when he made his innovations to the phalanx, he decided to make the spears as long as possible to hold with a single arm. So you still have that nice heavy round shield. You've got your single arm. You've got a very dense formation ready to go. And they're very powerful. But a good rule of thumb when you're looking at the phalanx against each other, it's longer spears is better. It's it's almost a childish idea that like, well, my spear is longer than your spear. We get to draw blood first. Range weapons weren't this advanced yet. Yeah. Really, having a longer stick was, yeah, <laughs> was the best way to increase range. De- definitely, yeah. Just poking the enemy with a, with a long stick. So Philip comes up with a brand new variation of the phalanx. and it, It's often called the phalangites, which literally means fingers. What this does, or the changes that really happen into it, is first, he makes the spears ludicrously long. And they are now held in two hands. And this is the birth of the pikemen. And pikemen will be used up up until like the late Middle Ages. It, even, it, even when gunpowder is invented, you still have pikemen hanging around for another couple of hundred years until it improves like beyond that. Beyond it's just, it, yeah. it's, it's useful for, for close to 2,000 years. Yeah. It becomes the most popular formation for quite a long time. There will be the War of Successions later. We'll mention those along the way. But pikemen will be the unit that is designed for it. So Macedonian phalanx or phalangites pikemen you can call them whatever you you like they hold these ludicrously long spears between 16 
feet and 22 feet, about, about that in length. They will arrange themselves in a very close-knit formation, nothing new here. They will have much smaller shields because they're using both hands to hold the pike. This is where it really kicks in. The first four to five rows will have their spears jotted out forward. So you will have a killing field of just spears pointed straight out. The row behind them will tip up their spear at like a 45 degree angle and the rows behind them will have them straight up at a 90 degree. So you have this porcupine hedgehog and it is a front facing wall of just spears and death and good luck if you're virtually any ancient formation or army or unit running against this because there's five or six spears in their front line and your front line has one and you're about to smash into this thing and it's going to be a very very dangerous problem. So that really rigid, fantastic phalanx formation will be super popular for centuries and it will lose decline, it will become unpopular, uh, it will become popular again. It, it goes in and out of fashion, but Philip is the guy who invents it and he uses it because he has amazing cavalry, but it's time to get the infantry up to that standard. The second part of the army, which is very important to mention, is traditionally the Macedonians have companion cavalry and that's kind of like their nickname. And you wouldn't be far astray if you thought of medieval knight on horseback with lances. And they are going to fight in a very strange diamond kind of triangular wedge formation. Now, what's very important about this is if you have horses charging at the enemy and you have them arranged in a square, just you can just picture yourself here. You've got a life line of 10 horses by 10 horses. You've got 100 there and they're ready to kind of charge away. As they gradually charge, the guy to your left, the guy to your right, you can't really quite keep up with them exactly. Someone's going to fall behind, someone's going to fall forward, someone's going to spread out left, someone's going to spread out right, and it loses the cohesion and it becomes a messy blob as it's about to charge at the enemy. However, if you only have one person at the front, two behind him, and then you have two behind each person behind that and two behind, and you have a, a literal pyramid of horses, the guy at the very front is able to go left, and you just need to look at the person in front of you and go, oh, he's going left, I'm going to go left as well. And you have this huge pyramid chain of we're all going left, we're all going right. And it's like an arrowhead on the battlefield, just going side to side, wherever it needs to go. And when it eventually does smash into the enemy, the very first guy is about to smash in. There's two men behind him smashing him with lances, four behind him with extra lances. And it just becomes this massive, heavy hitter. And this is very often referred to, this combination of the long pikes on one side and the heavy cavalry coming in behind and smashing as the hammer and anvil. Now, we've mentioned this a little bit before. It was used in the Battle of Cannae. It was used somewhat in the Battle of Marathon. But this is the bread and butter of the Macedonian army and of Alexander the Great and what he uses to get it to work. The phrase, a rock and a hard place, pretty much comes to mind. Yeah. And what their whole plan is to get the army caught in between those two things. Let's talk a bit about Philip II of Macedon. From the history machine's point of view, um, we'll get into Alexander's stats later on. And Philip is basically like the prototype version. It's not mm. quite as polished. And, and even he's aware of this. He, he relied more on diplomacy than Alexander ever did. He made his own you know, league of city-states within, yes. within Greece in the process of conquering Greece and building up Macedonia's strength uh, from, you know, a backwater to the centre of the Greek world. Yes. But his stats, they do have a certain pattern, which will come up a lot, I think, in, the, in this episode. The History Machine, we had three battles on the database, of which he won two. His wins over expectation, they're a little bit above average. His casualties dealt are roughly average, but the two things that are significant, which we see again and again... He did not take many losses. He took about 7% fewer losses than average. He basically did not lose as many people as you would expect, like, very consistently. And mm -hmm. also, the frequency at which the enemy commander got taken out, got either captured or killed, is much higher than the average would be. And okay. that's something we will see again and again, and that's really... You can see the blueprint forming for how Alexander is going to go about things. So it's definitely Philip is the architect of this wonderful army. Uh, this Macedonian army. Now, actually, I'll go a teeny bit more into detail of the specific army he builds because it's not just the Macedonian phalanx and the companion cavalry. He decides to integrate and use a very balanced, flexible army that has a mixture of skirmishers, it has archers, it has light cavalry, heavy cavalry. It's effectively, if you decided you're going to play a board game or a video game and you're building an army, you have this nice, lovely mix of units 
with the combination of siege equipment when you need it, like catapults, and it's all used effectively to kind of say, well, what situation am I in right now? How do I adapt and work around it? Where can I go from here? What? Who needs to be moved left or right? How do I deploy them in this particular area? And the composition of the army that he has built is flexible enough to do all of these things. And it's not just a basic, like the other Greeks, we just have lots of hop hoplites, a bit of cavalry, we're good to go, maybe we have a handful of archers. But his deployment and his composition will influence all of the successor kingdoms after him for centuries. And in fact, you could probably make an argument that his army is more flexible, probably more consistent and better than the newer successor kingdom ones. So with Philip in mind, a little bit of history behind him. He does unite Greece under the banner of, hey lads, we're all going to go to Asia. Way <laughs> We're going to go and conquer the Persians. Remember those guys? They gave us a hard time a long time ago. We better, <laughs> we better hit right back there. It's basically that, you know, for that plus the prior, you know, several hundred years, I think the key way to unite Greek people would be like, Persians, you know. Yeah. I know we love fighting ourselves, but <laughs> what if we fought the Persians for a little, just a little Just bit? a little while. In order to do that, Philip himself, he did have to fight some Greeks on the way <laughs> so that they could get united. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm doing this for I'm doing this for your own good. Yeah. So uh, a lot of the southern Greeks who would be like the Spartans, the Athenians, the Thebans, they were not very impressed with Philip because they were kind of saying, who is this northern barbarian who has built a really nice army and is using it all the time and yeah. has <laughs> given us all a lot of hassle. Who and does is, he think he is? Who, who does he's we we listened to like episode two of the of the podcast. Macedonia wasn't mentioned. You no, know. no, they're Athens, up, Corinth, they're up Thebes, backwater. Sparta. Yeah, they're nobody. They're they're, they're an upstart. They're nobody. They're terrible. Forget them. Who are they to dictate terms to us? So Philip, in a lovely kind of way, is like, well, it's time for me to show why I'm going to be dictating terms to you. And uh, I suppose that's a good thing to start talking about. Maybe the yeah Battle of Sharona. So, Cahal, do you want to take us through some so, of the stats and information about this battle? So this was 338 BC, and this is where Philip basically completed gaining control of Greece. I mean, a few exceptions, a few holdouts here and there, but by and large, at the, after this, Greece was under Macedonian control. Mm. So, History Machine, this one, it's kind of an interesting one, and you can really tell it's, it's like Greeks fighting other Greeks, because it had this battle as a 50-50 as a situation. It just saw the compositions wow. were quite similar, um, you know, same kind of cultures going up against one another. So it really had this as a coin flip. So as a result, the wins over expectation was like solid 50%. It was a very, very solid win for Philip. And in doing so, you know, he didn't maybe deal out massive losses to the enemy army, but he mm. took very small losses himself, which... You know, if your plan is, this is my stepping stone to launching a campaign for yes. Greece, you don't want to be taking big losses. You don't want to be dealing out huge losses to people that you want to join your side afterward. You know, strategically, it was kind of the perfect result for him, really. He just got, he got a very, very yes. strong victory. Also noticeable in this was that one of his sub-commanders was an 18-year-old Alexander. Yes. So, <laughs> getting his, you know, kind of first taste of, of this kind battle of and how to, how to work it. And yeah. Alexander at this time was in charge of, and this is where he will find himself all the time in all of his battles, is in charge of the companion cavalry, is the top of that pyramid of those charging horses. And he is, he's the guy dictating, do we go left? Do we go right? Where do we go? So he is in danger all the time. But he's obviously a phenomenal horseback rider. Now, I'm, I'm actually going to make a little bit of a side note right here because I think it's important to mention and uh, our listeners mightn't be fully aware of it. But historically, and this is historically, and we even see, feel the remnants of it today, heavy cavalry, that is cavalry that has armour, heavy weapons, charging cavalry, shock cavalry, these kind of things, they are the domain of the upper class. Because only the rich people can effectively afford to keep, maintain horses, armour them up if they need to, you know, think of knights and lances and kings, and it's really that only the very wealthy can actually afford the upkeep of horses in this kind of way and use them to keep them effectively for for military purposes like this and you see the remnants of it today in things like hunting it's usually oh okay they, these are the you know the dentists and doctors who have a horse and decide yeah. this is this is going to be their hobby you know that they love horseback riding and they love you know equestrian events and they love going fox hunting and if, it, if you look through the countries competing in equestrian at the olympics 
there are very few that didn't used to have an empire, essentially. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, that is very true. That is very, very, very true. So it's important to mention that when we talk about Alexander, he is the rich kid. He is coming from, he's a prince. He is coming from wealth. He is coming from nobility. And he is effectively involved in cavalry charges because he is from that class. He has had the best education possible. Like they've imported, te- you know, the best like yes. philosophers to teach him all his life he's, and everything. He's yeah. actually been tutored by yeah. Aristotle, which is like one of the famous, yeah. <laughs> famous intellectuals it's, of history. He's yeah. had everything handed to him, basically. Yeah. All he has to do is try and not mess that up, basically. Yeah. Very, very true. So you kind of ask, well, why isn't this episode about why Philip crosses into Asia and conquers Persia and becomes like you know, the king of everything. And very much so, it's because he is assassinated. So he created the League of Corinth, which was lots of vassal city-states around Greece and everything else. But um, obviously Greece, they love their infighting. You know, they mm-hmm. all the city-states, they have their own agendas. So Philip gets assassinated in 336 BC, which was two years after the Battle of Sharona. And Alexander ascends to the throne. He becomes leader. And uh, of course, new leader. Obviously, then you get some pretenders. You get some yes. city-states... Rebelling, you get, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe Persia funding some of those revolts because it can see that there are people, you know, gunning to try and threaten them again. Yes. Uh, so Alexander really, he spends, before he can really launch out towards Persia, he has to spend the first few years of his rule sorting things out at home, basically getting any rebellious factions under control, mm-hmm. uh, assassinating any political pretenders, you know, any cousins who might think that they should be king of Macedon, so yes. on. I suppose here we get some of his early battles as he figures things out, um, Mm -hmm. as he goes around the Balkans, basically unifying Greece and Macedonia. Up as far as the Danube. So this is the area that's a bit rowdy. Now, it does make sense because when Philip does die, it's the best chance for every kingdom that's under his thumb to say, oh, what, there's a new guy coming into town and we're all meant to pay homage to him? What battles and victories does he have? He's a nobody. He's just the son of this guy. Now is the best chance for everybody to revolt. And... It is very much, let's time to consolidate the empire, get everything ready before we decide to go to Asia and conquer everything. And the Balkan campaigns are very much where we're going to start off with this. So I suppose, Carl, do we want to kind of go through with this brand new shiny army, this like Formula One team that's ready to go and they've got a brand new driver and that driver is 19 years of age and he's ready to like prove himself will fire away, so... It was from this era of his reign when he was just taking out yes. rebellious city-states. The one we're going to mention is the Battle of Thebes, which was 335 BC, and, you know, Thebes we mentioned, that was a formerly very powerful, like, kind of... Yeah. They typically were, uh, top three Greek city-states, usually in control. You know, they, they thought, really, they don't want to be vassal to anyone else. Mm-hmm. They decided to rebel. Alexander went down there trying to take control of things. He realized, like, right, I am going to have to crush this thing if I'm going to get going anywhere. He did not want to initially, but he ended up destroying the city as a result of this battle. And uh, History Machine, again, we have uh, Greeks fighting Greeks, so the win over expectation is roughly, you know, 50%. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the casualties, de- this is very unlike his other battles. The casualties dealt over expectation. This one, he dealt 90% more mm-hmm. casualties out in this battle. Yeah. So this was a real, like, Massacre. Him stating, you're not going to rebel, or yes. you are not going to exist <laughs> anymore. Very much so. It was, it was just a yeah. total... Now, um, I actually massacre. want to, to mention a side note here, and it does make sense if you consider that right now, Alexander is the brand new king. He's in charge of Macedon. He wants to effectively unify or reunify Greece and conquer Asia. And this one city that gave him the biggest problem, Thebes, the city that originally had his father as a hostage, that were at their apex only a generation earlier and were really in charge of everything and were the dominant southern Greeks. If I destroy them, if I level everything, if I burn them down to the ground, if I do more damage to them than the Persians ever did to any city here, no other small Greek city-state is going to take a look at us and say, hey, maybe we want to uh, rebel as well. Because right now, they've been very heavily cowed. They've been made docile. You agree to our terms. We're all on board. Everybody's, <laughs> everybody's going to agree to this plan. We're going to Asia. When Alexander decides to cross into Asia, he does make a couple of several changes to the army. He realises that Asia is cavalry country. And that they have fantastic cavalry. The Macedonians do as well. But maybe it's time to increase the percentage of cavalry in the army. Now, I just want to include that because 
when people think of Alexander and they talk about this Macedonian army, this wonderful one that Philip built, this fantastic, this fantastic mechanism, this machine, they kind of say, you could have put anybody in there and they would have succeeded. Like, because the officer corps underneath it is fantastic and phenomenal and it's made of very exceptional people. And I just want to make a, a note or point it out that he does make changes when he needs to make changes to it. We need to change a tire on this thing. If we need to like go up or down a gear, we can do it. Before we go and take on the Asians, I need to mention Parmenian. Parmenian is a phenomenal general. He is Philip's second in command. And when Alexander is ascended to the throne, it's Parmenian that effectively lets it happen. Because Parmenian could have put almost anybody there. So there's wheelings and dealings and there's bits and pieces. But after that happens, most of Parmenian's relatives, cousins, nephews, sons, everything, they all get a lot of key positions in the army as kind of a reward of like, oh, thank you very much for making me king of Macedon. You can get to have loads of influence in this army as well. So that's just another little thing to, to mention that the officer corps is fantastic. A lot of them are related. They're buddies, they're chums. They feel like... You know, kids at a private school, like think of like a, an Eton club or the Tory party in Britain. You know, it's like they all know each other. They all went to school together. They're all yeah. pals and friends. And now they are going to go to Asia and they are going to stick it to the Persians who historically at this point have become very decadent. They are not the war machine they used to be. They're a huge empire, but they're just not as sharp as maybe yes. they used to be. They're kind of like, mm. as we saw with... Battle of Thebes, they were kind of hoping that they could just swat away threats by, you know, funding, funding other, other enemies. Sides. They weren't mm. necessarily interested in doing the fighting doing the themselves, fighting themselves exactly. if they could avoid it. Yeah. And what's important to note, around this time or a little bit before it, the Persians are actually very reliant on Greek mercenaries. If the Persians have a squabble, it's like, well, who gets to hire the Greek mercenaries? Because they'll be like the, they will be the fighting machine that will help us win this. So Alexander and the army, they're about to go and they're crossing into Asia and they're going to start their campaign here. And there is actually a Greek commander working for the Persians named uh, Memnon of Rhodes. When he hears about this Macedonian army that's uh, just crossed into Asia, he has several bits of advice. And the main part is, do not engage this army in a pitched battle. Now, I'll explain the difference between a pitched battle and a non-pitched battle. There's different kinds of warfare. So pitched battle is effectively... I'm going to line out my army. We're going to have this nice little uh, layout and we're going to fight each other. And at the end of the day, one of us is a big winner and the other person goes home a loser. We start dictating terms. We learn about the big battles were almost always pitched battles. But a lot of the time, it's not advisable to have a pitched battle. You'll have a guerrilla campaign or you'll, you'll negotiate or you'll do something else different or there'll be a siege or there'll be a sacking of a city. There won't necessarily be a pitched battle because a pitched battle is like going to the roulette table and you're going to spin the wheel and you're going to say, I'm putting it all on red or all on black. It's very, very risky. It's a high gamble unless you have an amazing army and the other side also thinks they have a chance, then it's not usually worth doing. And if I don't want to engage your army, we can just flee. We can try something else. You'll probably be able to burn our countryside, and destroy our things. So there's different counter strategies. But Alexander and why he shows up to be such a phenomenal person in our database. The machine they've designed is ready for pitched battle. They want to lay out their troops, they want you to lay out yours, and they want to go at it, and we'll have a winner. And if we just keep doing that, that's how we conquer territory after territory after territory. We keep going and we keep winning. But if the other side kind of say, maybe we have a guerrilla campaign, you can draw that out for years. You can bleed them dry, you can burn the land, you can burn their resources, you can empty their coffers, they can have nothing left, and then, then you'll kind of say, ah, oh, damn it, like we... We have this really expensive army and it costs so much to keep it going. We can't possibly afford it. We all have to go home. So Memnon of Rhodes' advice to the Persians is do not engage this army. Cut it off. Don't give it resources. Attack its supply line. Don't have a pitched battle with it. We will lose a pitched battle and they will win everything and they'll own this territory and they'll sack the land and they'll take what they want and they'll move on and they'll, like a bulldozer pulling through Asia, they'll just keep going. The Persian commanders or satraps the people effectively in charge of this area of persia are not happy about that idea a little bit reminiscent of um you know our last couple of episodes of punic war of the whole uh, fabian strategy and yes. how you know really they realize the way to do this is just draw this out try and contain them don't engage them directly and the other generals are like well no i'm going up for re-election so i'm going to try and stab them out now <laughs> exactly and, uh, yeah didn't end up went well in this one and uh I think you can guess how it'll end in this one, given that, you know, you've heard, I'm guessing you've heard of Alexander <laughs> the Great. You haven't heard of Memnon, no, probably. Wrong. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is going to be the first big battle in Alexander's arsenal of a long list of battles. And we'll go into the very, very important ones and we'll, we might skim across others. But this one is very important to mention because this is effectively, if they don't win this, it's over. Yeah. If they do win this, it's the start of a big campaign. So this is the Battle of Granicus. And this this one's significant. As you said, mm. Alexander ends up winning this as he won all these battles, which meant that they now controlled all of Anatolia. And, you know, so basically modern day Turkey. They now have Greece plus modern day Turkey. Yes. Um, afterwards, funnily enough, Memnon is one of the sub commanders on the other side, probably like gritting his <laughs> teeth the entire time saying, I told you so. Um, yes. One of the few sub commanders still to survive the battle on the Persian side. Yeah. I will, I'll explain so. exactly why that happened. And it was because uh, Memnon is in charge of Greek mercenaries those uh, very important units that the Persians like to hire. But they actually took a bit of a sideline in the battle because they were so convinced that this is going to go to the Greek side or it's not, you know, we don't want to, we won't be fighting fellow Greeks. But at the end of the battle, Alexander is not the kind of person to let that slide. He's like, well, hold on a second. You played the neutral card. You should have like come over to our side because I've killed a lot of Greeks and I don't know about you, <laughs> but there's a, a certain amount of you who are going to be killed right now or sold into slavery so uh so memnon is pretty much gritting his teeth like this is an unwinnable battle but was hoping that if i don't engage them maybe they'll show a bit of pity and it turns out alexander is not a merciful person no no, no. but um going through the history machine stats like you mentioned how kind of between bulk and campaign here like Mm. They're putting their plan in place, how we're going to execute things. And this yes. is where you see, it's a perfect example of that Macedonian style that began development with Philip and is now really coming mm. into its own, where casualties suffered by the Greek side, very low. Casualties dealt about average. Commander kills dealt out huge. They killed a huge number of sub-commanders. They basically decided, like... Kill the brain. Why, kill yeah. the head. Kill the head and the body dies. Yeah. It's just do what they need to against the enemy army, but like you don't have to go over the top. If you can just take out the enemy commanders, everything else will fall. And, you know, from a political point of view, it served Alexander quite well too because he could go in, go charging in Kid directly, like take take the high risk mm. thing. But, you know, his men see that they're going to stay loyal. And obviously loyalty has been a big issue with previous Greek yes. armies. So, uh, yeah, they see that their commander is willing to risk himself to take out the enemy king. He, they see that they're not just mm. cannon fodder because... He's not necessarily going for the, you know, enemy army infantry versus infantry. He's going for the enemy leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's a better look, uh, you know, for, <laughs> if you're trying yeah, to you relate to, to the yeah. comic be And, you know, because Alexander Silverspoon in his mouth, like, trust fund kid, essentially. He needs all the help he can get in, you know, getting the, yeah. <laughs> getting kind of the infantry men on his side and the basic soldiers. But, um, yeah, this one, very, very solid win for him. Has the perfect archetype. Mm -hmm. We mentioned Memnon on the other side. In this army, we also have, as some sub-commanders on the Greek side, some names that will appear again and again. One of them, as we said earlier, Parmenian. May as well go through some of his stats now. Yeah, since he's, sure. He's coming in now. So the dad base has four battles, all of which he won. Mm -hmm. He is a very strong commander in his own right, uh, according to the History Machine. He was one of Alexander's best sub-commanders in terms of wins over expectation, about 20% above average. And he wasn't just, you know, there are a few other sub-commanders and they, basically all the battles in the database, it's them underneath Alexander. So you kind of wonder how much are their stats Yes, being exactly. Influenced. Parmenian did have uh, one battle in the database that was just him on his own, which he won. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't maybe win by as much as when he was a sub-commander under Alexander, but it showed like he was, he was very competent in his own right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really, he follows that that archetype quite strongly where the casualties s suffered are very low and the enemy commander kills are very, are very high. high. Yeah. So that seems to be the, the Macedonian style of warfare seems to be we'll deploy our army, we'll set it up, we'll have this great cavalry charge and we won't worry about, we won't lose that many men at all ourselves. We'll actually lose very few because we've got this wonderful row of pikes and we've got this excellent diverse and flexible army we will try and kill whoever is in charge of the other army as quickly as possible once that's done we won't really need to worry about them anymore <laughs> <laughs> there are some battles in history that are turning points are critically important if you could have a list of like top 10 battles that something you know that influence history forever or that you know history is on a knife's edge or it's super important, like Marathon is one of them. The Battle of Cannae, which we mentioned in our Punic Wars episode is another one, the one that shows that Rome was almost defeated, it could have all been over, loads of strategies have been based on it ever since. But this is a historical battle 
like the Battle of Hastings, the Normans invade England and change history forever. This is one where history is changed forever. It's not a what if, this is a this is critically important for it's particularly Western history. This will determine what is going to happen. It's going to influence the culture of Asia. It's going to influence the culture of the Western world. And this is the Battle of Issus. Now, so far in our database, the leader of the Persians at the time, Darius III, he has not really shown his face yet. He is a very powerful, very rich, very influential person. He owns a tremendous amount of the known world at this time. He is now deciding, I've got to take on Alexander. I've got to snub this in the butt before it gets any worse. We've lost that battle in modern day Turkey, the Battle of the Granicus River. We've lost it. That is kind of unsalvageable. We could afford to lose it though. So it's kind of like, you can almost visual that Alexander is going into a casino with a briefcase of a million quid and he's trying to clear the house out. We could afford those first few losses, but now it's actually getting very dangerous and we need to try and work around this. So this is where we're going to get an imperial, huge, colossal Persian army. We're going to deal with it. We're going to try and nip this in the bud. We're going to end Alexander as quickly as possible. We're going to bring more troops to the battlefield. This is an incredibly important battle historically. If Alexander doesn't win this, it's over. And history, it, it's almost impossible to imagine what would happen because this guy inspires the likes of Julius Caesar. He inspires Napoleon. Think of any major military commander ever. They have Alexander as like an icon, as you know, they've got a but poster him on the wall. He is the archetype of this great men of history theory. And it is very much the Battle of Issus where he will lay out this wonderful Macedonian army ready to take on the Persians who outnumber them. And we're going to have to deal with this. So Cahal, I suppose, who is the favourite to win this battle first? That's probably an so important question. The favourite to win this is... Darius, like they have twice, yes. almost twice the numbers, it, depending on what source you go with, but yes. like roughly, if you average them, twice the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, like unit per unit, Alexander's army is probably higher quality, but it's just, you know, the sheer numbers thing. Darius yeah. is like set, pick the terrain, everything else. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, though, the history machine, it does have Darius's favorite, but only very slightly. Okay. And my theory as to this, because it doesn't really make sense, Alexander, because him, and his other sub-commanders, the Macedonians generally, they had so many battles relative to other... Yes. You know, because most generals, even really famous ones, they have like three, maybe four battles um, where we have any significant information on it. Mm -hmm. Alexander, he... You know, we have 11 in the database. He had probably twice that, except, you know, a lot of them, we don't have the history on it. Yes, so exactly. So we could put yeah. them in there. Yeah. But um, it's an, there's enough there, there's enough of an influence, and the fact that he won every single time, I think he has skewed the AI. So the AI, it sees this army composition, it sees that it's around this time, you know, in the kind yeah. of uh, in the exactly, late, exactly. you know, 300 BC, mm -hmm. it sees that it's in this region, and it goes like, oh, that's probably Alexander's army, they're going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it actually, the, the yeah. wins over expectation, like, it... it it really had, had a, a very, very slight advantage for Darius in this one. Like, it really, he's so yeah, heavily outnumbers so like, him. So if, if you want to say, Carl, the, the history yeah. machine, our AI neural, neural network, has identified that this particular army composition, this Macedonian yeah, army, in this the layout, place and time. in this place and time, with these kind of commanders around it, it's like, this is, this is a phenomenal composition. This is yeah. a work of art. This is, this is the favourite simply because of what it is composed of, where it is, Who's who's using it? That it's veteranized, that it's useful, that it's it's it shows results. Yeah. It it gets what it needs to get, and even if it's outnumbered like a two to one scenario, it's like you're still actually you're not the favorite, but you're you're not exactly in a bad situation yeah. either. <laughs> not nearly as much as should be, but yes. um, going through the other stats anyway, it's mm. it's quite an interesting battle. Again, it's the perfect example. They just went directly for. The enemy commanders in this one mm -hmm. really i mean that's that's how they want it the casualties dealt is about half of what the history machine expected okay and they did deal out plenty of casualties but they really they did they kind of ignored that part of the battle they went directly for darius and he panicked and fled yes he just it was the first time ever that a persian king had led the army personally and lost yes he fled all of his sub commanders were killed mm -hmm. and uh yeah with without mm -hmm. like I mean, you know, obviously very bloody battle and mm. everything, objectively, but compared to what it could have been, this was an extremely clean, efficient 
win. Surge, surgical yeah. win. Yeah. I actually, listeners, if if you want to see something about this, there was. There is a Roman mosaic that you can Google. And if you Google simply Alexander the Great and Darius, you'll find this as a result. But there's a Roman mosaic of Alexander charging Darius. And you can just see the face of Darius with the eyes wide open looking at, holy crap, this guy, he's coming for me. (laughs) (laughs) And he effectively, in the royal chariot, hightails it, gets out of there. Alexander is going to try and chase him down. But poor old Parminian who is responsible for the left wing of the army at this time, is having a bit of trouble. This is something that's really recorded. He's fighting the the cream of the crop of the Persian cavalry. He's having a hard time. And if Alexander doesn't wheel back around and help Parminian, he's lost the battle. Even though they fled the commander, they have it. the, The strategy has worked. This adaptable, we don't have to beat the army. We just have to beat the commander. It's worked, but we don't actually get Darius. So Darius gets to live to fight for another day. Alexander will have to clean up the army. But at this point now, you can say he is a contestant or a usurper for this whole empire. There's two big names. There's Alexander, there's Darius. At the the first battle we had here in Asia, he was a a, a problem. A problem they wanted to nip in the bud. But now this is a constitutional or an empirical crisis. Yeah. And Darius realizes at this point. And he, he basically goes to Alexander at this stage and says, you know what? How about we just, we, we call it this, you've taken over the entirety of Turkey, like pushing into, after the Battle of Isis, then like pushing into northern Syria. Yeah. You've conquered like a massive chunk of my empire. That's yeah. fine. I'll let you keep all of this. I won't fight you anymore. Yeah. Just like, can you just leave us alone, please? <laughs> Sir, I think you've gambled enough and the yeah. house the house cannot afford this loss. So yeah. we would like to politely ask you to leave. <laughs> yeah, just like no, no conditions, just yes. like peace deal here. Yeah. Alexander said no. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's on a winning streak and he's not going to quit now. No, no, definitely not. Yeah, you don't get the name The Great for nothing. Mm. So, <laughs> all right. So the Battle of Issus, a turning point in history, very important because this could have all ended for Alexander. They lose it, they go home, it's over. Persia, the Persian Empire at this time gets to continue. It probably becomes a little bit more like the Roman Empire. Maybe it has a resurgence. It's all very speculative, don't know. But Alexander is now putting this empire into a downward spiral. Alexander has now conquered that area. Like uh, he has all of Turkey, modern day Turkey enclosed. He has uh, near Syria. This, this is now his. And Darius has retreated to the eastern part of his empire. He's going to get a bigger army. He's going to try and pull it together. He's going to get a lot more horse archers from effectively kind of nomads and other tribes that are in his territory. He's got to deal with this powerful war machine that's plotting its way through, through his countryside and tearing it up. And Alexander and his commanders are like, okay, at this point, we're not going to go immediately after Darius. What we need to do is, if you can imagine the map of Europe, we have Greece. We pulled up along Turkey, but there's a whole southern Mediterranean coast that we don't own. And if we leave this behind us and go forward, we'll have an army in our rear possibly chasing us. So what we need to do is go down near Gaza towards Egypt and conquer that area. And this is where we'll probably lead into the Siege of Tyre. Yeah, so I suppose the Siege of Tyre, from a strategic point of view, it is not the most crucial part of his campaign, but it just deserves a mention for how bonkers this was. Because this Tyre is insane. was out on an island just off the coast and they, you know, they were like, well... Alexander can't hit us here. We have big walls. We have like a big navy. We're on an island. What's he? How is he going to reach us? His army is totally land based. Yes. Alexander decides to build a causeway. Yes. About a kilometer out, and yep. put a put a bunch of catapults at the end of that causeway. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's just just, a crazy just as a one. note as well, listeners. That causeway is still there today. So yeah. it's it's they moved. Like this thousands, wasn't like a temporary yeah. thing. No. They went like, no, this, I'm like yeah. going all out on He this. turned an island into a peninsula and said, this is how we're going to attack it. So, so it is insane. But I suppose he's like, listen, I cannot afford a loss on my record. Yeah. And I can't just <laughs> leave somebody here. So let's put a lot of resources and thought into this. And let's wreck this place. Yeah. So, yeah, really, stats-wise, the history machine point of view, it's nothing... Too interesting. It expected mm. like it basically was like once Alexander managed to reach there, he was going to win it. Yes, like almost certainly, and you know all the stats are average, but it's mm-hmm. just to get there. So he had the causeway. Mm-hmm. Then also to 
you know, he had to bring yeah. in ships. Uh, he had these massively complex maneuvers involving, uh, you know, Tyre had all these obstacles basically built up to prevent ships from ramming it. They had ships with cranes come in to lift those obstacles out of the way, then sent in the ramming ships to create a breach. Crazy yeah. one. It's it's a fun thing to look up and read through properly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. Ridiculous. But it's actually so over the top that once Tyre is dealt with, Pretty much all the other areas around are like, yeah, we capitulate. We'll yeah. uh, we'll agree to terms. We'll be under the yoke of your empire. We'll be fine. That's what we'll do. One place gives them a bit of hassle, and this is where Alexander moves on to his next battle, the Siege of Gaza. He's like, okay, time to deal with these guys. Yeah. So Siege of Gaza. Um, that this was basically the last place standing between him and Egypt, which is mm-hmm. where he really wanted to go. Really, they did not survive long. At this stage, Alexander, he's really big, began, begun like building up his, his kind of routine. He's just gone through the most ridiculous convoluted battle in his life. This is a straightforward one for him. History Machine had him winning, you know, 90% of the time in this one. Yes. And uh, typical thing, takes very few losses, kills the enemy siege commander, gains access to Egypt, and along the way makes use of some of those siege engines that they built for Tyre. So, you know, recycling there yeah, on his yeah, part. It's pretty know, good. Yeah. But, you know, it, it does show, like, the previous battle just... And this one, it just shows yeah. how adaptable he is. He has this winning formula, but if he needs to deviate from it, he, he does. very much can. And, yes. he, and he does. He's, like, he, ha- he has a great kind of like plan A, but if he needs to devise a plan B on the fly, he can come up with something Definitely. very easily. Definitely. So when he does get to Egypt, now this is possibly, to take this one with you know, a grain of salt, it's possibly propaganda, but he's meant to be welcomed into Egypt as a bit of a liberator, because the Egyptians and the Persians never really got on. Egypt, from even our first episode are such an ancient empire that they view the Persians as the new kids. They picture them as the the young upstarts. So when they feel somewhat liberated from the Persian yoke of empire by Alexander, they kind of welcome him. Now, as I said, could be propaganda here, but they kind of welcome into it and Egypt was going to be absorbed by the Macedonian Empire and be part of it. At this point in history, stuff starts to get a little bit... not I won't say unusual... But stuff starts to get a little bit strange in a sense of Alexander is now getting this crazy big reputation. Because the Egyptians, under the influence of like Greek culture, they form, you might hear the term Hellenization, where like it's Greek ideas are being pulled across as Alexander conquers and takes over places. It's more of a byproduct of conquering than anything. But this is where we get like Amun Ra, the Egyptian, an Egyptian god, is mixed with Zeus, and you get like an Amun Zeus. And they claim that, like, Alexander is somewhat related to him. They name him Pharaoh. And a Pharaoh is pretty much kind of a, a little bit of a semi, you know, a deity kind of demigod kind of feel to it. So at this point, Alexander can be viewed by the Egyptians as like a demigod. You kind of go, okay, don't let this go to your head. You know, spoiler alert. <laughs> it might just. But uh, it's around this time now where we start seeing very heavy influence of Greek culture melding with other cultures. And this will extend along the campaign to other areas like eventually there'll be like a hellenism buddhism fusion it's yeah. it feels like a weird cuisine restaurant where it's like <laughs> we're going to get two very different cultures yeah. and smash them together so we're going to see a little bit of the general the the after product of conquering of like okay my culture is mixing with your culture your culture is mixing with my yeah. culture and we, we trade example like you know obviously egypt is where you get the famous city of Alexandria. Yes. But there were like 20 Alexandria. Yes. He, he, he built a lot of name, cities named after himself and uh, one named after his favourite horse after it died. But that's later on. That's, yeah. that's in India. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely like the cultural influence comes in here. Here's where he starts seeing coins with his face on it in yes. Egypt. His uh, face with, you know, horns coming out yes. of it too. But, uh, I just want to make a small side note about, about coins in general. Historically, coins generally had either gods or animals or both on them, depending on whatever side of the coin. But Alexander may be the first non-fictitious or non deity person to be put on a coin. The other contesters are Darius and possibly Ptolemy. It depends on, like, when or where it was minted. So he could be, if you think about it, the first, which is an incredible achievement in itself, the first person to be put on a coin. Which is pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. It just shows you like how much influence he must have had and how famous and how much of like a, how much of a, of a tidal wave of, of both culture and militarization that he's bringing with him. So he's dealt with Egypt. He's consolidated this. It's worked out. He's got this lovely Mediterranean coast sweeping around. Basically all of the Eastern Mediterranean is now under his control. It's now under his control. It's now Um, under control of the the Greeks and the the Macedonians. uh, Right before we 
move on while we have this little break. But just, it's been a while since we've mentioned a general, and he has so many sub-commanders who are significant. I feel may as well mention Hephaestion, who's worth mentioning basically because he was Alexander's BFF, and he has been in, he's been a sub-commander in I think all or most of the battles we've mentioned so far. <laughs> you know, he was there in Gaza and Tyre and everywhere else, but uh, he was just, again, going back to the trust fund kid analogy, this was like... Just his, like, buddy back from, you know, yeah. private school, go over together, <laughs> may have been lovers, depending on certain historical interpretations, you yes, know, yeah. but uh, just, they, they were bros. And yes. uh, Hephaestion, he does solidly, according to the history machine, Yes, but he never fought on his own. He was always with Alexander. Mm -hmm. So his stats just kind of, they're like just lesser versions of Alexander's stats. Okay, uh, so Winfield like, for expectation, uh, about 25% more. Yeah. Didn't take many casualties, didn't do out huge losses, did good damage to enemy commander. Okay. It's, it's the typical so, pattern yet yeah. again. So it's Alexander light, like effectively. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay, fair enough. So as I suppose you, you were saying, he's a sub-commander of Alexander's. He only ever fought with them. So yeah. he, he kind of, he just has a, is a lesser version of them in a sense. Yeah. But there, definitely. Good, there are a lot yeah. of these sub-commanders to get through, so it's just... Yeah. Now and again, we're throwing one in there, and this is really where, you know, he, he's been involved heavily in the last few battles, so mm -hmm. worth mentioning. Yeah. Now, a lot of those commanders, even though they're de definitely important in how Alexander ends up conquering areas and working his way through it, uh, by the time of his death, that'll all come back to haunt us, but we'll, we'll also come back to, to that later. He was, he was lucky in the case of Pavestion, though, in that he died before Alexander did, also kind of suddenly and abruptly. Yes. But, um, and Alexander took that one hard. He, but, he very much did, mm -hmm. but on the plus side, it meant that there wasn't a big chunk of the empire that Hephaestion was trying to take control of afterwards. Yes. Okay, so with all that in mind, we've Egypt is consolidated, we've worked our way, our supply chain is looking well, we've got this fantastic army, we we had a little bit of uh, pressure put on a tire, but with, with a little bit of hard work and perseverance and catapults and siege works and advanced machinery, the whole thing's been blown apart. <laughs> so I suppose... Darius at this point has assembled this brand new up-to-date army with a lot of cavalry, very heavy. We got to deal with these Macedonians. I offered him half of the casino and he said no. <laughs> so, so he's going to take another gamble. We have to deal with him right now. So we should probably move on to the Battle of Galgamela. And uh, so this is another one. Darius III leading the Persian army. You mm -hmm. know, it's only once in history has a Persian king lost, you know, when he was yes. leading the army personally. This is going to be the second time. Yeah. <laughs> this pretty much goes how the last one yeah. went. Now, I want to make a little bit of a quick uh, side yeah. note, actually, just to even talk about this, Cahal. I mentioned in the earlier battle here, the Battle of Issus, that Alexander was not the favourite. But what does the history machine think about him this Yeah, time? at this stage, um, you know, I mentioned my theory that the history machine has, you know, basically come to recognise this pattern in this time period. This is in full... Full stream now. So this this, this, this time is peak it does Alexander. Think, this time it thinks Alexander is the heavy favorite. Yeah. Um, again, you know, severely outnumbered and everything, but it's just come to recognize this pattern at this stage. So mm. uh, yeah, it has Alexander's heavy favorite. Again, it it's very very similar stats really to the Battle yeah. of Issus. It's he does take more casualties than it expected him mm -hmm. this time, but again, it's just they were going for the commander, and again, they caused Darius to flee. Mm. Once and again, I, Darius I, did survive. But this time, he didn't survive very long. Eastern Persia had kind of its own thing going on within the Persian Empire. They had their own identity, and they were like, this guy is messing it up for everyone. He needs to be dealt with. And Darius III was assassinated very shortly after okay. this battle. Yeah. At this point now, Alexander is the lord of Asia, the conqueror. He, he controls the Persian Empire. I do want to mention a small little anecdote about it, about Alexander as well. There was a particular uh, knot called the Gorgian knot. The legend behind that was whoever would untie the knot would become the king of Asia. And it effectively happened that there was a small kingdom in Asia and uh, there was a little bit of a prophecy that someone who would come in on an ox cart and they would be the next king. They had that happen and that particular ox cart was tied up in a very convoluted intricate knot that was meant to be tied so complicated and tightly you couldn't see what what began and what end and this almost sums up alexander's kind of lateral thinking or work about problem solving goes well we just need to untie this knot so it takes out his sword and cuts it uh it does kind of fall into the category of it's probably propaganda it uh very likely could have went terrible for them because like what happens if this doesn't cut properly or we don't mess it up or whatever <laughs> it's also a little bit less dramatic, but it's been told that he might have removed the linchpin from the yoke and undone the knot that way. 
it's a lot less dramatic, a lot less flavor and flair to it. But he kind of had used that as a bit of a propaganda tool of I will be the king and master of Asia when they came across this uh, kingdom and undid that knot. But it's just a little bit of a side note that a lot of dramatizations and little notes and anecdotes would talk about him. as like, this was preordained destiny that he was going to be the master of Asia because clearly he was the one who was able to undo the Gorgian knot. At this point, he has gotten most of the Persian Empire. He's got like Babylon, Mesopotamia. Yes. He's, he's got a lot of it. Yeah. Think modern day now, Iran, Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now we come to the... Battle of the Persian Gate, where he is at the gates of Persepolis, which is the Persian capital. Mm -hmm. This is the end point of the Persian campaign. Whatever resistance they can offer, they're doing yeah. it here now. It's, you know, death rattles. It's the final, you know, hurrah, or the final stand, really, for the Persians. He doesn't really stand a chance of losing this. It's just, it's it's picking up the pieces at the end. He's about to take Persia. He's about to enter the capital. He's, a, he's about to control it all. Yeah, and this one, again, it goes it goes how his battles go. It had him as heavy favourites to win. Um, it had him about 90% chance to win in this one. This is one of the few cases, actually, where they did do significant damage. They basically wiped out the enemy army, so it was like 60% more mm. yeah. uh, damage I... than expected, and enemy commanders killed, as per usual. Yeah. So um, this one, it was, a bit, it was a good bit bloodier than his other battles, typically. There was a bit of a revenge element in this. You know, we, we said earlier how... The Greek, the kind of rallying thing where they could get on the same side was always against Persia and, yes. you know, kind of remember what they did to Athens and so on. And in the wake of this battle, Persepolis was basically burned and, you know, depending on the, again, it's hard yes. to say what was propaganda, what was, you know, written after the fact or whatever. But it's claimed that after, you know, basically the morning after kind of the hangover of this, Alexander was like, oh, we should not have burned this. This is a really culturally significant, significant city. city. This is full <laughs> yeah. of, like, incredible works. It's this was... We maybe went overboard on this one, yeah. killing literally everyone and burning it to the ground. Yeah, burnt down the Louvre and went, oh no, wait, that was probably a bad yeah. idea. Yeah, so <sighs> this, is, do that. <laughs> this is Persia now, mm. you know, with with maybe a few little, like, yes. you know, marginal areas to mop up. But this yeah. is Persia conquered. This is now a massive, massive empire that yes. Alexander has. He's Huge. definitely, like, Macedonia has gone from, like, a backwater in the corner of the Greek world to now the greatest world power i would say like at this point in definitely. time um, it's certainly within like western middle eastern history mm, definitely now at this point we were mentioning that the idea of hellenization and that the greeks are bringing somewhat of their culture towards the east and it's mingling so effectively there's a there's kind of a, a double culture mixing it's kind of noted around this time that once alexander now controls persia he gets a bit more decadent and for want of a better term, they refer to it as like, he's becoming more oriental in terms of the culture, the dress, the Persian robes, the lifestyle, the rings. He does around this time adopt the culture of, and you'll think of it when you think of like maybe a medieval bishop, someone has to get down and kiss my ring and kiss my hand. And the Greeks are not happy with this. And he, he does abandon that after a while. But they're like, we don't like, we're not Persian. We're very much Greek. And you're getting a little bit too comfortable living this Persian lifestyle. Even though you're not, like, you know, you might be in charge of Persia. You might now be, like, the the lord of Asia and the king of, of what would have been the Persian Empire. But don't forget, we are quite Macedonian. And there's actually, there was a companion of Alexander at this time who accused him of effectively becoming decadent and losing his Macedonian ways called uh, Cletus, who did save Alexander's life in a battle. And Alexander, in the fury of being effectively called, you're getting a bit too much of a sissy there, kills him. Yeah. And it, a bit, a, in a bit of wild fury. So we do think of Alexander, there's a lot of propaganda, but he's a very volatile, ambitious, yeah. he's becoming corrupt, thinking he's a god. You know, he, he's, got, he's got a lot going for him. He's in charge of a very large portion of territory. Yeah. And another kind of perfect example of this as well, as we mentioned earlier, the general Parmenian, mm -hmm. very strong general in his own right. Yes. Um, you know, he, I, I forgot to mention earlier, like the history machine has him as actually for any general about three or more battles. He has the highest chance of killing the enemy general of anyone. Yes. Like he, he so, was seriously effective in the specific modes that, <laughs> that Alexander wanted him to be effective in. Yes. So um, it, it's Parvinian's role of like, a, it's like the general who will commit regicide. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Um, 
yeah, we mentioned there's these rumblings around this time, around 330 BC. Yes. And one of the people who's, you know, involved in this and is convicted of tre- treason is Parmenian's son. Now, Parmenian was not implicated in this whatsoever. Yes. He was not involved. He was never, like, proven that he was involved at mm. all. But Alexander just felt, you know, we're going to be killing your son. It's going to get a bit awkward, so... I just want to kill you too. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the. I'm yeah. sorry. It's just the simplest solution. Yeah. I'm sure you understand. We kind of have to go into yeah. this a little bit because it's, it's, it's out, just going to be so it's, awkward. It's mad. So Parmenian, who is Philip's like leading commander, takes over. Remember, this is the guy who like promotes Alexander. Says he should be king and gets a lot of cushy positions in the army with his his corresponding relatives put into key positions. He doesn't know that his son has been implicated in treason and has been murdered, and Alexander, fearful that. Parmenian might find out about this, sends two of his close friends on racing camels across the desert because Parmenian is doing something very important at this time. He is guarding the treasury. When someone is in charge of the treasury, soldiers have to get paid. And if you find yourself on a big pile of gold and suddenly you have an enemy you don't like anymore and you're a fantastic commander and you find out that your son's been murdered, it's very likely you might say time for a civil war, guys. And considering Parmenian has had so many of his relatives ingrained into Alexander's army, it's ripe for him to say, you know what, this young kid's got a bit of an upstart put me in a terrible position time after time again I'm here minding the treasury it might be time for a rebellion or to take control of a certain amount of the army or to bribe a few people or to withhold some funds so it is so risky that it makes sense that Alexander says I want to kill this guy make sure nothing happens um so Alexander's two guys in the racing camels they stab him to death they then explain after the situation that he was implicated or his son was implicated in treason and they kind of have to live with it but I asked you, Cahill, to do this for me, if you, if you didn't mind. And it's using the history AI machine. We wanted to create a hypothetical situation. And the hypothetical is, what if Parmenian did take some of the army, let's say half of the army, and took on Alexander in a battle? So I ran this through the history machine just if you took generals with these, you know, modified the normal expectation with these general stats. And um, it was an interesting one. Now, it does see Alexander as better. Like, yes. it, it, he, like, he has some amazing sub-commanders, and it still has Alexander as better than all of them. And it had, you know, if it was a 50-50 army size, Alexander would probably win, you know, 75% yes. of the time. We're making an assumption here as well that the army is a mirror composition. Yes. I have the same amount of companion yeah. cavalry. You have the same amount of pikemen. We have the same number of archers. It's a straight-down 50-50 I got half the army, you got half the army. Yeah, it was based on the typical composition for all of Alexander's battles, basically, yes. that we had in the database. It was, like, the average mm-hmm. of them. So it does say, like, Parmenian, he probably wouldn't win if it was 50-50. So decided to see, like, you know, what size army would he have to have for it to become a 50-50 battle? Or even the favourite to win. Yeah. Yeah. And that tipping point happens around when he has 1.1 times the yes. size of Alexander. So, which is, you hmm. know, like, it's a, it is a significantly bigger army. But when you consider the History Machine had Alexander winning, like, 9% of the time against armies twice the size, it yes. says a lot about how good Parmenian, Parmenian was is. as a general too. That he maybe only needed 1.1 times yeah. Alexander's army. In very simple numbers, if they have a 50-50 army that's an exact mirror, Parmenian might win 25% of the time, is the yeah. rough estimation. Which is giving Alexander a lot of credit here, and maybe he's saying that he's inspiring, and he's great at leading the cavalry, and he's, he's very good. But if Parmenian, with all of his relatives interwoven into the army, was able to get 10% more troops than Alexander, he would be the favourite to win. And that is saying something, and that is saying, that is a very likely threat. So considering that Alexander has pulled all the way into Asia, he's conquered, he's beaten Darius, he owns this huge empire now, he could lose it all effectively on a coin flip. So you could argue, like, it was incredibly ruthless on his part, and maybe a bit paranoid, but... The argument is there. Like, you can yeah. understand the argument for it why does, Parmenian it makes so was assassinated. Sense. Yeah. As good and as useful and as reliable as a commander he was and as, you know, as sensible and loyal as well and how much that he's definitely responsible for getting Alexander to where he needs to be. I can really, you can really look at it and justify and say it's kind of had to be done in a real terrible king leadership, you know, p- political kind of way. Yeah. So, so with all of that aside, Alexander seems to be a bit... 
a bit headstrong now. He's a little bit paranoid at times. He's he's being affected by Persian culture. He's looking a bit different. He's acting a bit different. He's actually integrating some Persian units into the army to kind of feed up some of the gaps that are there. He's modifying it a bit. So he's getting his commanders now to marry Persian brides. It's coming a little bit, it's becoming very Eastern and his, his uh, officer corps are too impressed. But now they're going to keep going. They have Persia taken, they're going to move. But Alexander's like, let's keep going. He's an ambitious guy. So we're going to move on to something that's a little bit more over the top, and that's going to be the Indian campaign. Basically, he looks around and is like, where else do we know that exists if we keep going further in this vein? <laughs> you know, like, uh, without going back into Europe, like, where, where can we keep going? So basically, kind of modern-day Pakistan, northeastern India is the mm. only spot left that they know anything about. Yes. So that's where he ups to go next. Yes. Similar to the Battle of Tyre, there's one battle we're just going to mention here, which was small scale, not as big strategically, but just worth a mention for its craziness, and that's the Siege of the Sogdian Rock. This was a fortress on top of a cliff, basically. Like, to, yes. it, They basically felt totally safe because, like, they thought you'd have to be able to fly, basically, to get up to them. It was a sheer cliff face that had to be scaled mm -hmm. um, in order to reach the fortress. The history machine here goes like, ah, you know, you're trying to climb up a cliff face, you do not have that, you know, neither side has huge army, but like really don't have enough guys that you can like send up a cliff here. There's like a 20% chance Alexander's going to win this one. Yes. I think this is actually the, the lowest expectation he ever had of winning a battle. Mm -hmm. But, um... He planned something. Yeah, he he got 300 people and they climbed up that cl sheer cliff face, essentially. Yep. And the, the enemy commander just saw that and was like, oh... Oh, you're, no. you're you're at the door now. Okay, let um, I'm not going to fight Alexander the Great. Yeah, <laughs> Just, and in it, in, pa done. in panic surrenders, yeah. and that's it. So three hundred men climbing a cliff. Uh, historically, they haven't lost a single man. They're up top there. You know, it's like, haha, ha, we're here. <laughs> We've taken over this impregnable fortress simply by just climbing into it with a hand. You know, with a very small subfraction of men. And that's it. The whole thing is surrendered. So a, a little bit of a side note, but definitely one of these impressive if you want to look at Alexander from maybe a, a very idea of, ooh, thinking outside the box tactically. Yeah. How do we do this? It's like we, we could spend years sieging this thing and never get any yeah. advantage. But it's like, no, we'll just scale it with 300 men and that's it. It's ours. Yeah. And it worked. Very, a big thing with Alexander is when you think about him, he's a gambler. But he's a gambler where it's paying off and yeah. it keeps paying off. And he doesn't lose. It's it's a it's a very weird. I mean, historically, possibly there were so many people like this. But what happened should have happened happened. But this is the guy who just like luck. The odds are so low, but just he happens to be one of those people who gets the one thousand chance where he just keeps winning again and again. Yeah. Even where he mm. probably shouldn't. Very much so. Now the pitched battles make sense, but sometimes when you yeah. hear stories the crazy of crazy sieges like Tyre mm. and Sogdian Rock, they that just shouldn't have happened the way they did. You'd expect normally them to try and starve that place out and it would take months and months and mm. months and it would delay them for ages but Alexander he didn't have time to spare he was you know he yeah he, he we mentioned his first battle when he was 18 he doesn't survive too much longer after this one you know, yes. he'll only be alive a few years more after this so mm. he needs to keep pressing on um and I suppose really that leads to the main decisive battle of the Indian campaign mm -hmm. this really leads on to the battle of the Hydaspes River now there's a couple of notes to make about this battle and the army compositions and the changes and the modifications to both sides. This is not the first time, but it will effectively be the last time Alexander fights elephants. Now, in the Battle of Issus, they do take on several elephants and they work their way around it. They, the Macedonians are able to deal with it. But it's a bit of a frightful idea because uh, picture it that you're just uh, a Macedonian or a Greek or some other mercenary or, or a unit or group that is working for Alexander, this is the closest people ever get to fighting monsters. You're looking at something that's a lump, the biggest thing you've ever seen and it's trampling towards you with somebody on top of it, lobbing javelins or darts and firing arrows and whatever they need to do. And you, you kind of have to deal with that. And in the Indian campaign, they do take on many, many, many elephants. And this is where there's a couple of pros and cons to using elephants. And I would like to go through a couple of them. The, uh, the first pro is, it's a terror weapon. The opponent has no idea what this thing is. It's huge, it's strong, it's lumbering. It tramples your buddies as it walks beside you. You know, a foot goes down and you're crushed and it's over. If war is about trying to get people to flee in panic, an elephant makes perfect sense. The cons to an elephant, and there are several, 
They can frighten your own horses. They frighten the enemy horses as well. That's a bit of a pro. But they can frighten your own horses. They are prone to effectively retreat and stampede and go frenzy and attack your own troops. They are also very expensive to feed, very expensive to breed, to bring up and to control and own. They're a sign of, like heavy cavalry, are generally a sign of wealth, so you don't have too many of them normally. Another problem is breeding elephants. Now, historically, what was done to breed an elephant is you got an elephant to the wild, you cut off its hind leg, you effectively crippled it, you got another elephant and did the same, you hope one was boy and the other was a girl, and then you would raise elephants from calves, bring them up, try and domesticate them. But unlike cattle and dogs and cats and horses, elephants have not been domesticated that long, if at all. So they're much harder to train and to, to ride into battle and get to do what you want them to do. So they're, you know, they're a little bit stubborn, which makes sense. Uh, and the last thing is when you're breeding elephants, it takes a minimum of 18 months for the embryonic development of an elephant to happen. So they're costly, they're expensive, and they're time consuming. That is probably why we don't see too many elephants throughout history. When they're used, they're probably used for a bit of prestige, maybe as a terror weapon. They're going to be used later in history, and we've mentioned before in the Punic Wars, and you know some people are able to deal with them, some people aren't. They're a fantastic terror weapon. They're very good against pikemen and cavalry. They're hard to beat, they're very hard to kill. Now Alexander has to take on quite a few of them, and his troops aren't exactly looking forward to this. Yeah. History machines take on this battle... It's a very different feel to the ones he's had up till now. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell, like, he's moved through a combination, I suppose, of, you know, one, his, his army's morale isn't what it used to be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different army. There's a different composition. They're fighting a very different army now. They're, they're into India, into Punjab. It's, it's not like the Persian army tactic. So it's, it's a very different. Normally, it's surprising any time you have a commander killed in battle going through the history machine. It's relatively rare. History Machine, like, usually only gives it maybe, like, a 1 in 50 chance of happening per battle. Alexander did it almost all the time. Yes. But this is one of the few battles where he didn't kill the enemy commander, and he did just go for, like, kind of go for the enemy army. Um, he dealt about 30% more casualties than expected, which, considering mm. most of the time he's just ho hovering around average or slightly under it, that is huge for mm. him. And, um, yeah, going back to the commander thing as well, the, the Indian king Porus, who didn't flee like Darius, Alexander kind of... I don't know, he liked his style for whatever reason, and he decided, you know what, you can stay on, you can be satrap, you can be governor of this region now that I've just conquered. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm conquering your kingdom, but you still get to run it day to day. Mm. Now, there might also be a chance, simply because the area of Punjab, modern-day Punjab near India, along this area, is so alien to the Greeks, the Macedonians, and somewhat the Persians, that he kind of goes, I can't really put in a Greek person in charge of this area. They don't know the culture, they don't know the people, so I'll just... Get this guy who's already here and make him in charge and just have him loyal to me because it's it's a really alien place. It's, it's different. We don't know much about it. We barely know how to govern it. And it's now within our area. But it is at this point in history. This is where the territory, Alexander's conquest, hit the brick wall. Yeah. Because his army has been on campaign for about a decade. They are homesick. They, a lot of them want to go home and retire and work and, or whatever they want to do. They want to live their lives. They're sick of this campaign. They no longer want to carry on. Alexander is adamant to continue going to cross the Gange River to work his way through it. And you can take this one with a pinch of salt because, you know, it, it probably propaganda. It's not really the best. But it's rumored that on the other side, they see another army. And that army has as many as 2,000 war elephants. And it has several thousand troops and loads of bowmen and arrowmen and it's a foreign alien army and they, they they don't like the idea that they have this stretched army thousands of miles away from where where they come from originally and they have to keep going they're like the, yeah. the empire is big enough so at this point alexander wants to keep going because that is who he is he is the conqueror he has so much ambition he wants to control the world his ambition seems to know no limits and at this point, his army threatened to mutiny unless they go home. Yeah, at this yeah. stage, like, they're no longer seeing, you know, kind of the doubting leader who's going to, like, take out the old enemy of Greece, the Persians. He's now just, like, a slightly mad, paranoid. His favorite horse, Bucephalus, just died and he named a city after it. Yeah. You know, like, never mind, <laughs> he's willing to kill Parmenian and, yeah. you know, everything. But the horse gets more respect. You're kind of, at this stage, you're, and as well, the, the most recent battle, like, it wasn't... Like the old one where it's like, as the day-to-day -day soldier, 
you know, you're respected, we're going for the commander, we're not having you put your life on the line just to kill another face of soldier. This is one where they did go back to kind of face the soldiers against yes. one another. You're fighting elephants now. There just mm. isn't the same... And it, as well, like, you know, you, you've been fighting yes. probably your, all, you know, cl- your entire adult life at this stage on Alexander's campaigns. Things have been going on about ten years now. Mm. You kind of, you've taken over the known world. You kind of want to start reaping the wards, get your pension, go home, you know. Yes. It, it's yeah. just... It, they're just kind of exhausted at this stage, you know. They're yeah. just fed up. They're tired of it, yeah. This is where the, the phrase, you know, the when Alexander saw the, the breadth and width of his domain, he wept tears of salt for want of more worlds to conquer. Alexander is going to go home. Uh, they've decided the empire is now big enough. He's not happy about it. But he does something a little weird on the way back to Persia and people kind of criticise him for it. And it, it feels like a pet peeve, like a mini project or something <laughs> where it's like, this is my little ambition and I'd like to say I did it. In the same way someone might say, I like to say I, I crossed the equator, I went around the world or I've been to Australia. There is a story that Cyrus the Great, a Persian uh, ruler, who Alexander deeply admired, lost an army crossing a desert in Persia. And Alexander wanted to cross the same desert, but not lose his army. So on the way back to Persia... This is exactly why the army wants to stop. He's gone, he's, he's gone wrong at this point. Yes, yeah. So he's going to go through the desert with his army, while a lot of, like, they're, they're going to sail along the coast as well with some resources and, and, and groups. But he's going to suffer very heavy, harsh casualties and lose a lot of men simply crossing the desert, just to say, like... Hey, I climbed Everest, you know, when my, oh. when, my, when my idol couldn't do it, I was able to do it. And so, it, yeah, it makes perfect sense that something like this is absolute nonsense. Why are we doing this? And it seems to be for one man's ambition. So, yeah, so this seems to be, we're not quite finished with Alexander, but we're going to be finished with them fairly soon. So he now goes back to Babylon. He is dealing with, with bits and pieces. The Indian campaign is over. His troops want to go home. The problems now of empire are starting to show in a sense of they're all cool when it comes to conquering, but the same kind of people that are able to conquer huge amounts of territory are not the same amount of people who are great at actually ruling it and dealing with it and working with it. So it is around this time Alexander is going to die of a fever in Babylon. He may have been poisoned. This It's all very speculation. It's, it's, that's a hard one to call. I'm going to just kind of say, listen... He probably did just die of, it, of an illness of a fever in Babylon. That was it. Things like this happen. People get sick. And he did not have his empire consolidated. He didn't get to live to be long enough to effectively um, to effectively see his empire fall apart or fracture. So at 32, Alexander is in Babylon, surrounded by the successor kings and his, his officer corps. People are known as the Diodaki. They are going to be the successor kings of Alexander. And he gets very sick at this point in time, right before they were considering, maybe we're going to go and conquer Carthage. Yeah. That was like one of their extra options. Like, this Where is, else is do next... we have we heard of that exists? That, that exists. Yeah. We should probably take this, these places out and these places are worth money. But before this can be properly implemented, he does catch a fever or something like it. They're not really sure what possibly did kill him, what illness, well, you know. But anyway, he does die in Babylon and he's dying words to his <laughs> successors when asked... Who is to inherit the empire? He simply says, to the strongest, and dies. So, throws a so, spanner in the works. <laughs> kind of says, let's make this interesting. Whoever <laughs> feels they're the strongest gets to keep yeah. this empire. And now, that wonderful officer corps, uh, one of them we mentioned in our first episode on Egypt, Ptolemy, they are going to go at each other's throats, tearing apart the areas that were conquered to effectively... Almost the ambition of lesser men. Now, it's hard to compare your ambition to Alexander, but they're like, I want a kingdom, a very big kingdom, but I'll be happy with this. And this is what they're going to do. We may as well now, Alexander is dead, go through his stats fully from the history machine. And they are very impressive. So Mm -hmm. we have... In the database, and there are more battles than this, but as we mentioned, there just isn't... These the are ones that have information. solid data that we yeah. can use. Yeah. So, 11 battles, 11 wins. Uh, the long, Easily the longest winning, like the best streak. winning streak. Yes. Like, easily the one who's, who's had the most battles and won them all. Um, he's, for generals with over three battles in the database, he is 11th in wins over expectation. The average battle, he was maybe only, like, very marginal favourite. And to, you know, to basically win 11 coin flips <laughs> yeah. in a row is, is kind of what he was doing. Yes. 
Um, he was the second best in the entire database in defensively in terms of like he sustained yes. so few casualties compared to what he should have. Mm. Um, his casualties dealt isn't remarkable. It's only a bit above average. But that's um, not the strategy. The strategy, the strategy he seems to have is killing the kill, enemy king. Kill the enemy king, and he's the twelfth in the entire database at, at doing that. But six of the top ten are his sub commanders. <laughs> <laughs> so like, if he couldn't do it, someone else working for him could. Yeah. Okay. So like, it was it's remarkable. Yeah. Like we mentioned earlier, like the. Rocky Bashiato, you know, Floyd Mayweather, undefeated boxers. And I think Floyd Mayweather is a good comparison because he was, you know, he's undefeated, but he didn't do it through being amazing offensively. It was really good defense defense and also just recognizing, here's how I'm going to win. I don't care if it's like the flashiest way or like, yes, you know, the most groundbreaking way, but But this will get me to win. Yes. So just the incredible defense, the incredible ability to take out enemy commanders. mm, I do think that's a fantastic example because when we think of it, you think of the Floyd Mayweather and you think of his father and uncle who were trainers as Mm. well. For people who aren't really boxing fans, it's something possibly, look, work up. He's got a fantastic career, but he's an undefeated boxing champion. Uh, He's pretty much in and out of retirement every now and then, but he's phenomenal defensively. He can change his strategy when he needs to change it. But they have a very clear game strategy and that's it. And they, they're just wonderful prototype of, of how to win. Similar to the Rocky Marciano, another heavyweight champion of you know, the, the 1950s in, in heavyweight boxing. It's very easy to make the comparisons between the two. But in summary, you can look at Alexander if you think of him as a sports star. As somebody on a team of that has never lost a game. That they have a phenomenal reputation. They've won all the awards around him and he retired early. Yeah. And I think as well, like I mentioned, I think in wins over expectation, he's 11th overall. But I think going through the database, I think Sola is the next one to overtake him. So yes. it's, it's it's hundreds of years later that it someone is. overtakes him. Like he's, now, he's number one he's, for a long time. He's so unbelievably influential. Julius Caesar looks at this person like, this is my idol. Napoleon Bonaparte. These are huge people in history. Look at Alexander with pride. Try and recreate their things. I think it is um, General Montgomery in World War II for, in Britain wants to invade parts of Asia simply because he goes, I want to be the first Western person since Alexander the Great to do it. And when he considers, well, yeah. like roughly 10 years to take over from, you know, mm. Western Greece to Western India, mm-hmm. they were on horses and going over mountainous terrain just to like to travel that distance in that time. Yeah. You know, it could be difficult depending on the if, circumstances if somebody, to conquer it. If somebody told you to insane. walk that in 10 years, yeah. you know, it, it's insane. It's crazy. It's super impressive. So I think... He definitely is somebody, he deserves the title, the great. His record seems to show itself. You might argue that he inherited a fantastic army, he did, but the data shows he used it. It's, it's mm. no point having a Ferrari if you can't yeah. drive it. And even just, you know, mm. the, the defensive stats shows that he kind of respected how much he had been given. He wasn't going to waste it. He wasn't going yes. to he didn't throw squander it. Away. it. He, yes. he was very cautious with what he had and mm. like used it as best as he could and tried to minimize yeah. its losses. And he led from the front as well. Like it, it, you'll very rarely see even an ancient commander, somebody being in the front of the charge involved, you know, with the total aspect of the army. There's no way you could have said he was a coward. There's no way that you could have said that he didn't, you know, didn't fight his way through it or wasn't heavily involved in it. He is, you can argue he is the rich kid. He inherits a lot of stuff, but he's just there doing it, winning. And you can see how he inspires so many people, even even just years after him or hundreds of years after him, that the Romans will admire him, that the legacy of those, even his name and his father's name, think of the name Alex and Philip. They're a lot more common than someone being called Ptolemy. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> all of them being, you know, Macedonian names. So I suppose to wrap up anyway, may as well go through at least some of the sub-commanders because, you know, the... They're the, responsible Alexander for dies, they have meeting basically the partition of Babylon which decides who gets what. It doesn't last long. They instantly start war. There's a, basically a war between, you know, like half a dozen different main yes. factions. There's a lot of... Switching pl- sides mm. constantly. It's, it's, it's a mess. Plotting, but, assassinations, battles, uh... It, it, the whole thing falls apart very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come across this later in another future episode down the road when we go through it because there's so many battles, so many people involved, so much territory changes hands. The It's it's like a Game of Thrones in terms of the amount of drama that's involved. After that, we'll, we'll put in some of the stats here for these people and just explain. I suppose some honorary mentions for these successor kingdoms. Number one, and History Machine, of all of Alexander's sub-commanders, this has him as the best, Seleucus. And this is maybe, I would say as well, one of the ones that has the highest chance that you may have heard of them. He, he basically got the Seleucid Empire, which is huge 
territory it was like kind of Anatolia, Mesopotamia, uh, a lot of the Israel, Middle East. I think, is the yeah, some, yeah, yeah, to an extent, um, kind of bordering into Persia, some of Central Asia, yeah. huge empire, and there's there's a reason he got that he was a phenomenal general in his own right. Like uh, Parmenian, he's one of the few examples where yes. we have battles on his own against some of other former some commanders. Of friends, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he won a lot. His wins over expectation is. 0.38, so only not too far behind Alexander. He had five battles, five wins in the database. Mm-hmm. Like Alexander, not quite as good, but he killed a lot of enemy commanders. Yeah. Um, the average battle he was expected to yeah. take out, you know. I, I want to mention that kind of unlike Alexander, Seleucid would be fighting up until close to his dying days. He would yes. be an old man fighting in the battlefields. And some of the old Alexandrian army that would break apart and join different sections of this will be recognised and fighting into their 50s and 60s. And you might say, these are a bunch of old men on the battlefield. But their reputation is so incredible that they have this kind of awe about them. Like, I don't want to have to take on the old Alexandrian yeah. army. Like, these guys conquered all of Persia. They might be old men and we're young or whatever, but, like, these guys know how to fight. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah, Seleucus is definitely the most notable, I think. Um, he has mm. joined forth the longest unbeaten streak in the database. Basically, every third battle, you'd expect him to kill the enemy commander. And the one thing with him, though, and this is following a real trend that we've seen this episode, like Philip, like Alexander, they build up this huge empire, and then they die right after. He never really got to enjoy it. He... His mm. his final battle, the final battle of the of the wars of Diodaki was battle of Coropidium, which was against Lysimachus, another of Alexander's sub commanders, who was building up his own kingdom as well, kind of what would be modern day Bulgaria, Romania, kind of yes. Eastern Greece, near the Balkan kind of areas. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but there's a reason why you've heard of you might have heard of the Seleucid Empire and not the Lysimachian Empire. Seleucus killed him in this battle. He took out his army. He won, but Seleucus also died. Very, very shortly after, so uh, no happy endings really for either of those. Yeah. We'll move on to another honourable mention, and we've mentioned him before, we've done it in the first episode, but I suppose we might just refresh you with Ptolemy. So Ptolemy is one that I think is more significant strategically. Um, He was not unbeaten, he had seven battles in the database and six wins, Mm -hmm. but, you know, very solid. Again, fits the mould quite well, Uh, wins over expectation of Mm 0.13, Again, took out the enemy commander, won three battles. But he was much more cautious, took a lot of different sides during the wars of Diodachi, depending, you know, what suit. He wouldn't necessarily deploy his army unless he felt that they were going to win it. Yeah, fair um, enough gamble. But, in fairness, he got Egypt, which was one of the best places yeah. to get. He didn't lose it to any of the others because he was cautious. And he lived into his 80s and was able to plan successors. And mm. his... His dynasty lasted until Cleopatra, like 300 years yeah. later. So uh, yeah. maybe not tactically the best general of all mm-hmm. the sub-commanders, but he played the long game better than I think anyone else yeah. in this episode. So, so I, I'll, I'll agree with you. I think that uh, our history machine does very much record your tactical ability. And it because simply it's, it's almost impossible to record a strategic ability. Who could define what's a fantastic strategy? Who can define the... the, the per, who can put a percentage in how well a strategy was actually implemented or used... Um, it's a very difficult thing to actually quantify. Tactics, a lot more easier. The history machine can deal with that. And he comes across as somebody who's definitely much more strategic. In the end, you did mention, Cahal, he ends up with Egypt. He ends up with the body of Alexander. They mummify it. And it will become a tourist attraction for a long time. It will be visited by Julius Caesar. It will be visited by Augustus Caesar. It will be visited by numerous Roman uh, emperors. It will be visited by Pompey. If you, a lot of these are these are kind of Roman commanders. The body will move around and we we'll actually kind of have uh, lost track of where exactly it has gone. A Roman emperor actually takes his breastplate from the mummy and uses it like, I have Alexander's armour, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so he's got this fantastic reputation. So Ptolemy ends up with like Alexander, the finest part of the kingdom, Egypt, the jewel of the whole thing, and ends up with the body of Alexander because that like kind of legitimizes your dynasty, sets up a fantastic dynasty that lasts until, as you mentioned, until Cleopatra. So strategically, probably the best of, of all of them. 
Now, there are several other commanders underneath them in the officer corps, you know, the successor kings, and it makes for a very interesting part of history, but we'll just leave it at those two for now, because we can come back to these again later at a later episode and really delve into what made them different and how they modified the army, how they made their changes, how, you know, they modified the phalanx a little bit, they made the spears even longer with even more armour, which would come back to bite a lot of them. Um, so, with all that in mind... Uh, Carl, do you want to do, considering we've named quite a lot of commanders yeah. there, we'll do a top five of this golden age of Macedonian militarization. So at number five, could you tell me who comes so in, please? So number five, going by wins over expectation, we have Parmenian. Okay. Who, uh, wins over expectation, point two oh two. Mm -hmm. um, most significant thing, which is the case for most of these generals, like every other battle he would kill the enemy commander, like point four five. Yeah. Uh, commander kills over expectation, didn't take losses, didn't deal out heavy casualties either, but like very solid general and established himself in one or two solo battles as well, which yes. I think makes him significant. It makes him stand out a lot more, and even though he's a only... threat really to Alexander yeah. too <laughs> in the end, a bit too much. Very much so. So coming in at number four, please. Number four was Alexander's BFF, uh, Hephaestion, mm -hmm. with 0.256 wins over expectation. Excellent. And, uh, Best commander kills dealt over expectation of any general with three or more battles. Oh, wow. So, like, he was real... Like, he he did what uh, Alexander wanted of him. He won, and he killed the enemy commander. And, uh, mm. yeah, every every other stat, yeah. pretty much average, hovering around zero, but those are the two ones Alexander wanted, and... And that's what he delivered. delivered. Okay. So, coming in, then, please, at number three. Number three, uh, one of the other sub-commanders, and... Significant general, I suppose, in the wars of the Diodaci. Afterwards, we have Antipater, and his dynasty was basically put in charge of Mastan, basically of the home kind of territories. Yeah, he was kind of left at home for a lot of these battles, but left in charge. But after the death of Alexander, really started playing his hand. Yeah, he only had two battles, so maybe his um, stats are maybe a bit more skewed. He didn't have enough time for them yes. to level off, but his wins over expectation was 0.364, so very good. Commander kills, again, 0.469, so almost mm -hmm. every second battle he would be killing your enemy general. Yes. Uh, all those stats hovering around zero, so yeah, fits the mold perfectly again. Mm -hmm. um, you could see why he was considered a steady hand to take care of things at home. He was, he was what yeah. was wanted out of a general. And then coming in at number two. Number two, as we mentioned, Seleucus, yeah, just went through his stats there earlier, He's like fantastic. extremely yeah. strong and... There's a reason why he got, you know, him and Ptolemy probably got the, the, best, two winners. the best regions following the wars of yeah. Diodaci, like so, the solid empires mm. that arose as the successors yeah. from so, Alexander's empire. So we could say that Ptolemy ended up strategically with the best location, but Seleucus is the one that came out on top in terms of tactical winning of like, yeah. I'm going to have this wonderful, nice, solid empire sitting on the side of the Mediterranean coast in a very nice position, controlling lots of resources. I don't own Egypt. Don't know how... Ptolemy really snuck that one away from me, but but I'm probably the best of the successor kingdoms or successor commanders yeah. after our number one, Alexander the Great. Yeah. And he's just, he can't really be touched by anyone else. His, his ones are, yeah. his stats are exceptional. He's peerless. Point four two one wins over expectation. Um, yeah, that's why he gets his own episode, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is the, the stats, fantastic... The, stat, the, the history machine definitely backs up his games. The fact that he his battles skewed the AI so that they expected him to win when he was out number two to one. And yeah. they're like, yeah, 90% chance this guy's going to win. win. Yeah, it's just, like, he's just that good. It, yeah. it, 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 he, was, he was just yeah. that good. Just the that, the that reputation mm, holds up. The reputation, the composition of the army, the tactics, the flexibility... The history, the veteranization of his army, the layout, the everything. He is peerless in his time, unquestionably. There will be later down in the historical idea that he is after like the Battle of 300 in Thermopylae. He is before Julius Caesar, but it, you will very find it very hard-pressed to find any antiquity commander after him who's not heavily inspired about it. Even in our last episode in the Punic Wars... The two super commanders of their age, Hannibal and Scipio, both agree he's the best. And that seems to be his reputation. And you know what? It, it's very much justified. So th thanks very much for listening. And if you want to reach out to us, you can hit us on historymachinepodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter and you can check out our actual website, 
historymachinepodcast.com. So for the next episode, I think considering the time it is, we've gone through some very important characters and we've mentioned him before. And he is heavily inspired by Alexander and looks at his life at 30 and says, I've done nothing. This man has achieved every goal I ever want to do. We will do our next episode on good old JC Julius Caesar. So thanks very much for your time. I've been Niall. I've been Cole. And best of luck and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.